of you know, this is a series of seminars that we're um, hosting as part of the Wamsey Kimberley Note, the Kimberley Research Note, which um, myself and Kelly Waples, who's just had to make a phone call, are uh, the Node leader team for. So we heard the cats. So we've got 26 research projects, and these guys are one of those research projects. And the idea of this seminar series is that as the projects come to their um, culmination, um, presenting the results of what's gone on with the project and we have directly after this meeting we meet with the project and an advisory group which is um, people from our planning section, um, some of the regional guys, the regional managers and things, um, Department of Fisheries uh, and some people that are going to be the end users of the data to try and really synthesise some of the management implications for uh, the information we're getting out of the project. And also looking, you know, where would we go in the future if we continue this kind of research in the Kimberley? Uh, what are some of the things we can do to monitor, you know, ongoing monitoring programs, those sorts of questions. So we can really value add to whatever comes out of the research. Because this is a, a really big push. This is um, the Kimberley program's $18 million that came out of the Kimberley Science and Conservation Strategy um, that's been uh, ramped up to $30 million through uh, um, co-contributions from all the research agencies. So this is a, a, a good example of a multi-university and agency program that's come together to try and get the best science for connectivity. Um, I'll let these guys explain exactly who that is and what they're doing. But as I said before, um, uh, this is one of 26 programs. We're producing these, and this one's come out of um, Joe Myers working with Alita from Wamsey, and these are available on the web for each of the projects. And the desire is these are like a, 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 a summary of some of the science that's going on in the research, but then if you're for, interested in further information, you can go to the papers or the final reports as they get produced. So these will be, um, uh, these are available on the web. Uh, for some of the projects that aren't finished, they might be a, just an updated one through the project, and they'll end up with a final one which summarises the whole project. And then Kelly, and my role as well is to make sure that the management implications of the research is really drawn out in the final report as well. So uh, any questions um, to the guys and then if, if any broader questions with regards to the community program, you can come see us up. So Ollie Berry is the project leader. You're going to start off? Mm -hmm. Ollie Berry from SIRA is the project leader for the program, so I'll allow him to introduce the team. Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure to, this has been quite a journey with this project and it's really coming together and we're really proud of the work that's happened. It's a real pleasure to present it to you. Um, uh, I apologise, this slide this is one of my favourite slides and um, asks a simple question and presents a, a simple sort of simple answer, what sustains populations? Um, and, and you know, it's ridiculously simple, but a, a, a population, and if we're, we're interested in managing populations very much, um, is, a, is the, the things that are local, local processes, births and deaths within a population, sustain population, but also the things that link populations organisms in different places. So this is the immigration and immigration part of the equation. So, and that part is what I'm going to talk about today, and we're going to talk about today in a tag team, and we'll, we'll call that connectivity as a shorthand. So, um, you're all ecologically literate, so I'll just take it as given that you recognise that connectivity is a, a vital underpinning of population dynamics and ecosystems. My people get really excited about connectivity in the ocean. Um, because the physics of, of currents, um, tides, um, have great capacity to distribute organisms a very, very long way. Um, which has implications for how the systems operate, the scales at which they operate, and the scales we might be interested in managing them. But then biologists stick up their hands, of course, as usual, and say, well, it's much more complicated than that if you inject biology. So the, the potential for connectivity in the ocean is great, but inject biology and, and realise connectivity is, is not always the same. Okay, so with that in your mind, that sort of theory, I'm going to talk about Kimberley, which is the focus of, of our work, and talking about why we're interested in connectivity in Kimberley. Well, it's a, it's a big place, it's a remote, and it's valued by all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons, whether they're economic, um, cultural, um, just intrinsic value. And um, I guess crystallising some of those values, there's been a real push to um, consolidate a framework for managing the Kimberley. For example, recent uh, presenting in reserve, marine reserves. But I think it's fair to say that um, in comparison to other parts of Western Australia and Australia, it's relatively unknown in terms of the science underpinning for management. And what science in terms of bi biology has been done there has been more about describing pattern of biodiversity than processes like connectivity. 
but it's a really different sort of a place. I mean, it's, it's very complicated in terms of the coastal topography. It's very complex. There's lots of islands and, and, and bay, bayments. And it has the largest tropical tides in the world, which uh, spawns these massive tidal currents. And so in terms of connectivity, which we're interested in, that potentially has huge implications for the scale at which systems operate there. And so it was that knowledge gap, which was really what this project was about trying to introduce. And as Stu said, there are, this is a, there's a cast of thousands involved in this project, and it's good to see some of them, some of them here. So myself, um, Jim Underwood and Catherine McMahon are going to be presenting in turn different aspects of this project. Um, I just want to talk, I'll just briefly set the scene for how we approach characterising connectivity in the Kimberley. That's it's a really big place and so to do this most efficiently, we decided to take a focal taxa um, approach to select some organisms which we thought were representative. As I said, it's a big place. And so we had to sample strategically, and I'll come to each of these in turn, but we sampled over, over a range of spatial scales in the Kimberley. And we sort of wrote this very recent wave of new technology in gene genomic sequencing, which has given us an enormous power, statistical power, to, to use genomics and genetics to reveal fine scale patterns of connectivity, or subtle patterns. So I'll just go through each of them in turn, quickly. So in terms of focal taxa, we're trying to be clever about this and, and select organisms that were either revealing in terms of their life history or important to people. So for example, we thought, well, some organisms that are habitat forming would be important. Things like corals, is it an obvious choice there, or seagrasses. Things that are important to people are things that are harvested, like fishes, or um, there's some harvested mollusks as well. But we also thought we need to stand a, a range of trophic levels. Remembering this is the very first time anybody's looked at connectivity in the So this is a sort of a, a first pass of this, but we try to get the maximum bang for the buck. We also thought in terms of the interaction of the, the biology interaction with the oceanography, it was important to, to get life histories that are going to interact in different ways and maybe make those organisms differently exposed to the tides and currents. So we're thinking about things that spend different lengths of time in the plankton. So remember, most marine species Movement of marine species is really about their larval phase, I mean, they're microscopic. And these, whoops, these are the species we came up with. So, um, two corals with contrasting life histories a brooder, so very short larval duration, and a um, broadcast fauna. Similarly, two seagrasses with contrasting sort of seed types a sinking seed and, and a floating seed. We've got the trochus, which is a large gastropod that people, indigenous people especially harvest, but it's harvested throughout the Indo Pacific. It's got a short larval duration. And then a couple of fishes. We've got a sort of a coral reef obligate um, homocentric and a, a, a harvested sort of snapper, a pelagic spawn and a benthic spawn. And they have different lengths of time in the plant. So we sort of covered a range here of, of kingdoms and, and life histories. Moving to sampling. So by taking advantage of a lot of collaborations and kindness of other projects and related projects, these yellow dots represent samples that we're able to obtain sort of outside the, the main um, Kimberley connectivity project. And that's to put our Kimberley work in context. And so that includes samples in the Northern Territory, down from Shark Bay, even some samples in Indonesia, which aren't represented. And then we'll return to this area a few times, and this is the Dampier Peninsula, and this is the Buccaneer Archipelago, and this is King Sound, and this is the Sunday Strait where, where these massive water flows have happened, so it's a very dynamic um, oceanographic environment. Those little, little dots represent sites where we're, we're able to spend some focus sampling and try to collect all of our taxa uh, in common, common locations so we could make really nice um, comparisons between them. The final aspect of the design. I wanted to cover was genomics. Now, I made mention that it's really difficult to measure, to, to measure dispersal in organisms, especially in marine organisms. And so we, we're taking this genomic indirect approach. It's, it's widely used, sort of in a nutshell, the idea is that under isolation and under different degrees of isolation, genetic differences accumulate in populations. <coughs> and we can measure those differences and look at them 
spatially. And based on some assumptions, we can make inferences about levels of demographic connectivity between sites. And this is what our data set looks like, I guess. Um, it's a huge study. There's a, a huge number of, of sites, a huge number of individuals. And I want to draw your attention also to the huge number of genetic markers. And like I mentioned, this is to do with the gen genomic technologies. Is this just Kimberley or the whole sample range? This, sorry, this is the whole sample range. Yep. But I would say that in, for all of our organisms, most of our samples were collected in the focal zone. So the, the, the upshot of, of having a large number of markers um, is great power to, to reveal subtle patterns. So now I'm going to pass over to Catherine, who's going to launch into uh, results and what they mean. Thanks, Ali. So we finished sampling a couple of years ago. <laughs> and over, over the last sort of year and a half, we've been working in the lab on our data, analysing our data, and bringing it all together to sort of see what our major patterns are. And the way that we're going to focus the talk today is really just starting off with our major findings and then giving you some examples um, that support our major findings. So the first thing we found was that the extent of connectivity differs among species. And we did predict that because we had um, a range of species with different expected dispersals, local scale or broad scale. And what we found is they didn't always, they were different and they didn't always follow our predictions. So for example, if we look at the two corals here, we can see that we expected the broodmanai to be more of a local disperser and the acropora aspera to be more of a broad disperser but they sort of were dispersing over, la, over similar spatial scales. So there's something going on there in terms of the biology and the hydrodynamics. Um, and then we had the, the trochus and the fish that were really quite um, broad scale dispersers. So we worked this out through looking at spatial autocorrelation. So we looked at all our individuals and the, the spatial autocorrelation of their genetic distance. And essentially these sort of um, distances that we're coming up with are the scale where we have the spatial order correlation um, no longer exists. So it's really the level where we're getting um, breeding and interaction um, among those individuals. Um, the other um, example is the, the seagrasses, they're the two species that I worked on. And we're getting really um, our broad scale dispersal, the lassia, which has these buoyant fruits that in the Caribbean can float for 300 kilometres, we're founding them really quite restricted and only around 5 to 10 kilometres. So this is a bit, this is what a spatial autocorrelation graph looks like and we're detecting relatedness um, in the Holophila individuals over about a 20 kilometre distance. So once this um, spatial autocorrelation gets to zero, it means there's no more where there's no more spatial order correlation there. So it's this sort of area where we're getting our, our neighbourhood and our individuals interbreeding together. In contrast, we have the, the um, Pomocentrid Milleri. Uh, these samples are over a, a much larger spatial range, um, up to 400 kilometres. And we're seeing um, relatedness is detectable over that entire distance. <coughs> now Milleri has a quite a long larval duration, there, 20. 20 days, um, but it tends to um, be really restricted to, to small reefs, and this is quite a quite an interesting pattern that we're seeing there. So moving on to our, our next three major findings about the fine scale patterns that we're seeing and the fine scale processes. We're seeing among our taxa that some of the barriers between populations are shared. And there's also some important stepping stone locations and some transition zones between our sites. And this is in this Sunday Island Buccaneer Archipelago part of the Kimberley. <coughs> So there were two species that over this whole area, we didn't detect any barriers. So they were 
all the sites were acting as a panmictic population, uh, breeding together. There were three species, the, uh, the two corals and one of the holophila, where we detected this barrier here between the Sunday Islands and the Buccaneer Archipelago. And we did predict that that may be either a barrier or, a, or some kind of transition zone because of the really strong currents um, that move in and out of King Sound. And the third barrier that we found was just for the seagrass Thalassia, the one with the buoyant fruits. And we found that there was a barrier between the northern part of the Buccaneer Archipelago and the more southern part of the Buccaneer Archipelago. So in this species, the populations here were quite distinct from the, the remainder of the populations. Kat, is there any feature in that orange box that would like the <coughs> strong currents that would indicate why? Or? We did do um, uh, Ming Feng from the sorry, <coughs> did some hydrodynamic modelling and particle Okay. modeling and so for this this species there was um, some uh, association with the hydrodynamic and the genetic distance so the the oceanographic modeling did explain some of the reason for that barrier particularly in this region here <coughs> and for the final species that we looked at the the stripey um, we found across the whole region it was it was more of a transition zone, so there was no real clear barrier, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a minute. So we identified some barriers, but there was also evidence of um, transition zones, and one of the examples was the Acropora species, and what we found there was this transition zone here, so individuals from the Tide Rip and Mermaid Island, which are around here, sort of intermediate between the Buccaneer and the, the Sunday <coughs> Islands. You can see that they're somewhat between the populations around the Sunday Islands, which are these um, blue colours, and the populations in the Buccaneer, which are mainly the red colours. But still, the, some individuals from Tide Rip cluster with those um, northern sites of the Buccaneer. They're having this sort of transition between the two. And a similar type of pattern was found with the, the seagrass, the Lassia. So we had most of the individuals from the Sunday Islands here uh, and the North Bedford Islands. And these are the the Buccaneer Archipelago up the top there. So some of these individuals from Tide Rip Island are the sort of intermediate between the two northern Buccaneer Archipelagos, showing that from Rip Tide or Tide Rip up to the north, some kind of transition zone occurring. And a final example in terms of the transition zones is with the snapper. <coughs> and working with um, the Department of Fisheries, they collected samples all the way from the Northern Territory down into the Pilbara, and you can see this real transition <coughs> in the right way through the Sunday Islands here. So you're getting these are more of the Northern Territory populations, or the Kimberley. Um, these are the around the Sunday Islands where you're seeing sort of a mix between the the yellow and the blue population clusters. And then as you head further south, we've got another population cluster right at the end. So this is that structure output, um, sort of mapped onto this map of Western Australia. And you see these sort of green cluster, the blue cluster and the red cluster, um, showing the three sort of um, metapopulations. And then if we zoom into the Kimberley, that area there, you can see that as you move across the Sunday Island, you're sort of getting a mixture of the green and the blue until right down here, you're back to the blue. So you can see that there's no clear um, barriers, but really that transition across the area. Okay, and I'm going to swap again, hand it back to Ollie. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, of course, with, also if I just talked about the coastal Kimberley, um, there's been a great interest also in the offshore shoals and reefs, the Ashmore Reef, uh, Royal Shoals, Scott Reefs. Um, and they're very different places, and people have sort of wondered why, why the biotas in these places are very different. I mean, in some ways it's not surprising, environmentally very different, the water's much clearer, of course, and very turbid in the coast. But the, the other idea is there's also, is, is the reason they're very different because there's basically no connectivity between them, because the hydrodynamically they're just not linked, even though they're sort of latitudinally sort of in parallel. And so I'm just going to present a couple of case studies where we, and nobody's, Nobody's actually been able to test whether it's one of those two options. Is it because there's no linkage, or is it just because they're environmentally very different? So we looked at this in some species, and we had samples from, from both sides. So this is for proper aspera, and so we have samples here from the coast, which is all of these, and samples from Ashmore Reef. And as you can see, um, there, while there is indeed some structure within the coast, it's, it's nothing like the magnitude of the difference. So um, even though this is probably covering a, a similar distance to this, there's, there's a much greater differentiation inshore, offshore. And that's also reflected in Trochus. These are all the coastal sites here. This is, these are PCAs. And these are our two offshore sites. We've got um, Scott Reef and Royal Shoals. See they're like more similar to each other, even though they are actually as far apart from each other as they are from, from coastal sites. And this is kind of important because um, trochus, in, in the case of Scott reefs, is certainly harvested, harvested very heavily. So there's been concern about you know where are these, where we're going to get recruits to replenish this. Now obviously in, in this case not going to come from the coast. What's the um, larval stage? How long is it? Well, in tanks it's only supposed to be five days. Wow. Mm. Uh, <laughs> But you know, you can see it's, it's full, very mixed in the coast. Yeah. Not like they're being seen from one to the other, like human seen. No. Um, well, I guess you mean in terms of uh, Indonesian fishing. Yeah, that well, I think that's rolling, something yeah. worth, worth considering. Yeah, yeah. Um, people have been going there for hundreds of years. Yeah. And certainly in contemporary times, there's lots of translocations of trochus around the Indo Pacific. So. Um, and uh, I guess Catherine mentioned before, I mean, from CSIRO has done a bunch of particle tracking work for us with, to help us make sense of, of these results. And, and what we're showing here is four different seasons for an assumed eight days spent in the plankton. The particles released at each of our sites, which I know it's very hard to see, little, little dots along here. And each color represents particles released from a different site. So this is autumn, winter, spring and summer for eight days in 2011 and 40 days. I guess the, the take home message is that there's very little evidence in terms of the physics that there should be connectivity, and that is corroborated by, by our observations, genetic observations, which is quite, <coughs> quite nice. <coughs> the next major finding is about the relationship on the bigger scale between our Kimberley bioregion, which is at the focus of our interest, but you know, what, what are the relationships, demographic or genetic, with other regions? How interdependent are these regions? The other regions being places like uh, the Pilbara, or overseas even. Okay, so going back to Miller's damselfish, um, in collaboration with um, Rich Evans from the Department of Parks and Wildlife and uh, Fisheries, um, we have a nice sampling across three bio, bio regions, Gaskell and Pilbara and Kimberley, and you can see there's three nice clusters. There's another PCA, and it turns out that it perfectly matches the Kimberley, Pilbara, and Gascoigne. And we can map those PCA um, coordinates onto a map, and you get this is just like Catherine showed with the striking snapper. You, you get this really clear, the genetically differentiated, and by implication, demographically quite independent regions. Seagrass is operates, uh, we've got based on Catherine and her PhD student Udi's uh, work, extends all the way into Indonesia, so it's really giving it a a really regional scale um, story. So I guess the take home message in terms of Western Australia is that um, the, this is for Thalassia uh, with a floating sea. Um, West Australian populations grouped together. This is based on structure analysis, uh, independently of the Indonesian ones. These lines are indicating um, extended connectivity, so it's quantified. 
uh, the thicker the line, the more connectivity. But an interesting result, and this will come up a bit later, is that of the Australian population, the West Australian populations, it's those in the Pilbara that have the greatest linkage with Indonesia, and um, Kimberley is much, somewhat of a backwater, and that's something that um, I think Jim or Catherine will touch on in a moment later. Uh, this is, uh, so this is representing this result, this is a clustering analysis with structure, and here are the Pilbara sites, very distinct from the Kimberley, so even though they're the most similar to each other, in fact they're, they're very different genetically from each other operating quite independently, and independently from Indonesia as well. It's quite a different story in terms of the stripy snapper, where we have some, okay, so again, we've got this nice broad sampling all the way up into the Northern Territory, and there's another PCA, we've got clear distinction of those gas going. But unlike the damsel fish, we've got much more of an isolation by distance effect in, in the more northern regions, which is this perfect um, rainbow is because there's a, a sort of a gradient and an isolation by distance effect as we've got these Northern Territory samples, Kimberley, Pilbara, with that transition zone which Catherine mentioned earlier there. So you've got sort of a, a hybrid of, of bioregional and, and isolation by distance happening in this one spe in this species. So I think I'll pass on to Jim. Thanks Holly, Catherine, it's Jim. So, so far we've been talking about um, you know, using our genetics and genome techniques to look at the relationships between our different areas of populations uh, through their relatedness, so how strongly connected are they by how similar or different the genetics are. We're also interested in the genetic diversity, so that's the amount of genetic diversity in the different areas that we're looking at. This is more a sort of evolutionary type scale um, processes that we're, we're after and we're wanting to get an idea of basically how big those populations are and how much genetic variation is available for them to, to adapt in the, in, in the future over multi-generational timescales. So what we get um, if we look at across the taxa is that we're, we're getting quite a range of different um, patterns. There's no single pattern that we're, that we're observing that's common. So even in the corals, you can see it's Slightly pretty weak relationship, but this is our main focal area through the centre, through the centre here around Buccaneer and Dampier. There's not a lot of variation. This is gene diversity up here, so we're not. We're, there's really not a lot of variation, and the same for the, that's the broadcast spawning species. A slightly um, trend, increasing trend. So we're starting in the north, moving the south, and for the um, brooding coral, there's a, there's a very weak. Um, decreasing trend brought about by a couple of anomalies. So you can see here, this is the site on the west coast of that Dandy Peninsula. We've been saying that that's a very small population, very isolated, it's on its own. It's very unlikely to be receiving a large input of genetic material from, from these, these areas further to north. And in contrast, this is um, Ashmore Reef for the broadcast fauna. It's say the same thing, Ashmore Reef is really is on its own in relative to these markers that we've used. Um, compared to the inshore Kimberley. So the amount of diversity at each site? That That's species? the amount of genetic diversity at each site. Yeah. Expected heterozygosity is, is our measure of it. But, you know. So this is for the trochus again. Not a lot happening in our focal site in terms of the pattern. Um, and we get a, and the offshore reefs of Rolby Shoulders Scott Reef, we get a reduced diversity out there. So. What we, what we, the inferences we might make there is that those populations are, are smaller and, and more isolated than, than these, these areas through here. Less, less opportunity for, for adaptation, if they need to. So this is for the damsel fish. We get a really nice pattern here. So this is running in latitude, so from north to south. We get the islands, um, the reefs in the north, high diversity running running down as we go, go further down. So that, we're saying these, these areas have got the, got the largest, most connected populations and that's quite a common pattern. That's one pattern that we'd, we'd generally expect across, across taxa. We did see it also in, this, in one of the seagrasses. So again, we've got, this is distance from the coral triangle, so moving from north to south, and, and a, a fairly strong pattern there. But you can see, and then, as Ollie pointed out before, we've got the Kimberley sitting way outside that pattern. So, 
that w when we saw in terms of the genetic relatedness from through from the Indonesia into the Pilbara, that that's borne out here where the, the inshore kimpi is really sitting out outside that long-term <coughs> gene flow. So so far, we just this this last finding was a bit of an offshoot of the of the pro program. It wasn't was at the, the heart of what we're after, but for the coral species, when we when we first looked at these analysis, we um, we ran a ran our, our preliminary work, and um, and one of the species is the broadcast spawning species. We found that we we're probably looking at, or that we were looking at, four major um, groups, genetic lineages that are that are morphologically indistinguishable, but very divergent if we use that genetic analysis. So basically, this is a structure plot, a clustering plot. This is a probability of belonging to a particular cluster or cluster. You can see there's some genetic, um, geographic structure to it. So this is the Dampier Buccaneer, our central area. That's the, um, the Kimberley mainland. And this is the, the sort of to the north and the offshore. Some geographic structure, but basically <coughs> these four, four clusters are living in sympatry, sympatry. Some we've collected them within a few metres of each other at many sites. <coughs> if I code a PCA according to this cluster analysis, we can see that these um, groups sit very separate. And if we run our standard sort of FST type analysis, so that how big is this difference? We're looking at, at an FST of 0.6. So that's very big. That's, we're talking different, different species, although <coughs> to make that call properly, we need to do a lot more work. What we can say is that these guys are on different <coughs> evolutionary trajectories. To give you an idea of what um, the coral ecologists up there are having to de deal with, um, this makes it all a bit complicated. So I'll just draw your attention to this is um, what we call Aspera A. Um, this is collected at one site, this is collected at another site, all from that same group. Those they're two morphologically very different, really. Um, this is from Aspera B, from a different cluster, huge variation in terms of genetically, that's also Aspera B. So you can, what you can see is that there's, the amount of variation between these genetic clusters is similar to the amount of variation that's within them. Makes it all quite complicated. So what does this all mean, especially for, for you guys? What, what, are we, what are the implications? And as you mentioned earlier, you know, the, one of the main the main focuses of this project was actually to put this across into, into an understanding that the managers can use. So how we decided to do that, we had a lot of commonalities, we had a lot of disparities in our data. The way we're going to present it is by talking about those sort of trophic levels, if you like, those areas. So we're going to look at the, the seagrass, uh, which is the corals in the seagrass. They sort of showed some similar patterns and they're more on the, on the habitat forming species, so forming a three dimensional structure, or in the case of the seagrass meadows, they're the, the ones that are eaten, eaten by the dugongs and the and nursery habitats and, and for the turtles as well. Then we'll look at, that's a bit of a, is that, is that the, um, yeah, it's <laughs> okay. So that's, I'll start off here. So basically, what this done, done a reverse for the slide on it. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll just move on and we'll just run through it as we go. So we're looking at the habitat providers to start with. So um, what does this mean in terms of if we're going to design protected areas and networks? What we saw was that um, that connectivity for both the corals and the seagrass were generally occurring over scales of less than 20 and 30 kilometres. So, what this means is that if we're going to look at trying to provide a protected area that, that um, encompasses that routine dispersal distance, they need to be about that distance wide enough to encourage that self-replenishment or recruitment, self-recruitment back into the system. And this will also help with aiding recruitment, supplementing recruitment outside that system too. They also need to be separated by about that distance so that occasional um, disturbances that occurred over this sort of scale, there might be some, um, some re recruitment between those areas to, to supplement that local disturbance ratio. 
So staying on the seagrass and the corals, um, the general pattern that we found was that there was restricted connectivity between the damp butt in the archipelago and the damp peninsula. For one of the seagrass, it was a little bit higher, it was sort of within the Buccaneer archipelago. But what we can say there is that these are acting as demographically independent um, populations and that they have to be managed as so. However, there is some evolution important exchange of genes, so you can get... There, would, there was, over most generation climate scales, um, there will be that exchange of genetic material that will be helpful if they need to need to adapt in the future. So, however, what we also saw was that there was negligible connectivity between those neighbouring bioregions, so between the offshore reefs and also the Kimberley and the Pilbara. So that inshore Kimberley area for these corals and seagrass, they're on their own in terms of, of how, in terms of the, the available genetic material that they can draw upon in the future. And finally, just that um, cryptic diversity that we found in the corals, um, it, basically what that means is that if we found four, what we think are species, four um, evolutionary distinct units among one morphological species, this is, um, the ramifications for, for managing are that they were, I think we're underestimating the amount of biodiversity that's, that's up, up there in these hard corals. This, is, this corroborates with a lot of work that's going on throughout the world and particularly in the Kimberley. So for the harvested mollusk, um, for the trochus, we saw that no, there was no restrictions um, within our focal area between the damp here archipelago and the, and the damp peninsula and the button here archipelago. So this is, we can treat this as a single stock and that if there's maintenance of, of the healthy sources of recruits, that will, they will spread out through that whole, whole region. However, um, there was restricted connectivity between the offshore um, <coughs> shoals and, and, and Scott Reef. Um, so what this means is that recruitment from outside those areas um, is, is unlikely to replenish any, any over-harvested stock. So they, these, these atolls and the inshore reefs are reliant on their own um, production over time frames that are relevant to management. So looking at the reef obligate fish, this is a down to fish. If we, if we wanted to use that as a as a species for a model species for looking at protection of those those kinds of organisms, we found that there was restricted connectivity <coughs> between the Kimberley and the Pilbara regions. So that recruitment between these regions is unlikely to replenish those populations, so they need to be managed independently. There's occasional inter-regional connectivity, so it was, wasn't massive differences. So we're thinking that these, the, the exchange of genes between the Kimberley and the Pilbara will happen over multiple generations. Um, so that, that's, that's good news for them in terms of adaptation in the future. For example, if we're passing on warm water genes, um, warm water adapted genes from the north to the south, that's likely to happen. Looking at the harvest of fish, the stripy snapper, we found that there was restricted connectivity between the Kimberley and the Pilbara, and to some extent the Northern Territory, although we need to probably sample, fill in the samples within there. Um, so again, that means that, that recruitment between these regions is unlikely to replenish those populations, but there is these transition zones in between that will be passing on these genes. So, so that's a good thing for those guys as well in the longer term. So that's about all, all, all we have really and we'd just like to finish off that this has been a, um, a well a fantastic project really. There's been a lot of wonderful connections made between people as well as looking at the connections between the, the organisms that we were looking at. Um, it took a little bit of a while to get off the ground. James Gilmore did an excellent job of, of getting the uh, institutions to sort of start to cooperate after a, a bit of argy-bargy and once we uh, actually finally got up into the field we sort of <coughs> hit the ground running and the team really got together and it was, it was a, such a range of, of diversity of, of people and um, we all worked well. The cooperation was uh, something that, that I certainly have enjoyed greatly along the way and it, it, it was in both in the field as well as since we've been coming back so that everyone's brought a lot of their own expertise. It's been excellent actually being able to cooperate, learn about um, taxa that is not our focal species. 
and I think um, we've all benefited greatly from it. So thank you to all these people. Be mentioned this um, project was got a really good rap from the local indigenous groups, so mainly work with Buddy Joey up on one arm point. But do you guys work with Dammy as well? Dammy again? Mayala. Mayala. Mayala, okay. Um, and just the there's definitely, um, certainly, when we talk to the indigenous groups, there's some researchers that um, interact very well, they come back and explain the results, they go to the schools and things like that, and others that just aren't quite as communicative. But it's the, these guys did a, a really good um, um, a job at trying to really get those guys on board with the project. <coughs> So it's really good. Are there any questions of this? They're facing the other way to avoid looking at you. So, but are there any questions of guys about the research that I've um, done? I'm Kev. Hi, Kev. Hi, Kev. Hi, Kev. Hi, Kev. <laughs> no, easy question. Is there anything in your findings, is there anything different from the Pilbara and in terms of implications for management of each region? Or is it largely the same story? So, the in the, so the work that we did in the Wamsi dredging for the Pilbara. Um, for the Halophila, we found a lot more clonality in the Kimberley than we did in the Pilbara, but um, work that's coming out of some collaboration that I have with Richard, where we're extending our Pil Pilbara sampling, is, is showing the same thing. So um, I suppose that'd be the first thing, a lot, um, a lot more clonality. Um, the lower diversity in the Kimberley for the Lassia, which, which we mentioned in this talk. Um, Scales of connectivity for Halophila were, were similar to what we're seeing in the Pilbara. I think it sort of is worth pointing out, as um, as Kat mentioned, that um, this project not only obviously was through the Kimberley region, but they had great collaborations. Rich Evans doing a project through the Wheatstone offsets down the Pilbara, um, obviously through Indonesia and other locations. I think through the Wamji dredge node down in the Pilbara as well. So they've been really capitalising on not just, and that's what we you know we have been really supportive of is is going outside. Uh, the project limits and not saying oh, we're just restricting it to this but really including other stuff as well because it's uh, obviously there's no wall separating the Kimberley from the rest of uh, the state so really interested in understanding I think the project's done really well at doing that as well. Any other questions? Bob? I'm curious just about that the standard that's got the great connectivity is there anything different in the biology like time of spawning or anything like that that might be distribution if it's smart with distribution or are they just naturally so you mean the gender that has a broad yeah, dispersal? Yeah, Well, it's more or, less, more or less what we expected because it has a 35-day pelagic larval duration and it spawns pelagically you know, in, the, in the open water. But what we didn't expect was that there's this zone where, well, for some reason, they don't disperse as, as, um, as they do elsewhere. Yeah. And presumably that's to do with hydrodynamics. You know, the um, pink sound funnels huge volumes of water, fresh water, um, out at the time which they have larvae in the plant. Maybe that's an explanation. Well, but we expected them to be the, um, most broadly dispersing. The other, the other little thing that's here, which is what the Bob and Anne has shown down from there, the traditional owners, reef tenures and harvest regulation things fit well with the restricted distribution type of things and the pelagics and all that doesn't matter and it fits regulated within the same together. Yeah, we worked a lot with indigenous guys yeah. on this project, which was great. But as I say, between management, there were management systems for reef, reef law, like trophies and all that sort of thing, apart from the fish was the farmers, but you know, all the time. So uh, often you get a steep slope <coughs> that though, so in, in the initial um, spatial component, uh, you might drop 50 or something. Can you then draw some assumption then that, uh, okay, maybe 20 kilometres is our, our range of um, interbreeding, but perhaps within 10 is where the 50% happens or something like that? No? <laughs> yes. We've yeah. had lots of conversations yeah. about that. Yeah. It's been interesting it? looking at, it, at, at the different the um, species of different biology have quite different um, 
spade orchard co correlation as well, yeah. So we're finding that the sessile organisms, the corals and the seagrass, they tend to have sort of a, a plateau in the beginning. So it might even go up and down for a, for a, spa for a space of, for, one, for the corals it was, it was about 500 metres. And then it starts to drop. So if you're looking at, an, at a, say, a brooding coral, that you, you can say that that sort of self-seeding scale is over about 500 metres. So that's a, that's a genetic neighbourhood, that's where, you know, where, gene, where the, they're just completely mixed. Once it starts to get past that, um, that distance, then the effect of genetic drift, which is like random process, just random processes of, getting, of differentiation, start to influence it. So, and then there's a balance between that and gene flow until it hits the zero. The zero. So there is, yeah, so where, as that's, where that starts to drop, like you're saying, there's a, there's a, that's I guess the twilight zone, depends how, how, what sort of time frame you're looking at in terms of, okay, within that before the drop, and the, the, then you're looking at that every generation there's going to be recruitment, self-recruitment within that. That distance between from the drop down to where it actually hits the zero is, yeah, that'll, that'll be probably historical, you know, different spawning, the type of the um, <coughs> environmental conditions during that spawning, how big the spawning was and all that sort of stuff. So over, yeah. I would say that people are starting to, increasingly when we get a lot of markets and are able to resolve kinship relationships quite well, people are starting to actually look for kin. So, okay, this is a half sieve, so we know that's got to be one generation apart or something. And how far apart are they? Or how far apart is an offspring from its parent? So that it's kind of getting at the same pattern that you observe in all the correlation, but in much more direct ecological terms. And I think that's something we might explore. If we haven't yet, but we probably will. Yeah, so then, um, so the parental type thing, then that becomes more biased, I guess, by a recent disturbance or you know, much smaller space. It's a very short space in space. Space. Yeah. Yeah. But then yeah. the wider ones, because it kind of evens out over temperature. That's right. Where do you think the differences in the results lie with respect to um, the larval duration and or you know, the, the method, one, one's a human source for and one's a you know, broadcast for? I mean, do you think, would you have got a human source for that had a longer time than plankton and that made a difference? Like, I'm just wondering why, you know, what is it you think that made carbon tartar so different to Miller? Like, you know, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think on the big scale, it's probably to do with habitat connectivity. So, carpos probably have more continuous distribution all the way down Kimberley into the Pilbara um, because they're not obligate reef species. Whereas, our sampling in the Millerai reflects that actually there wasn't coral reef in that sort of category. Is Millerai all the way across the top of Australia and down the south? Well, there's a. There's a, there's a sister species over yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that would be an interesting <coughs> thing to do. Because carbon tartus is, is all the way across the end of the soil. Yeah. 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 That was a big surprise, though. They, you know, because we were thinking, you know, that, those damselfish, they care in little rock pools. You know, that we thought we would would might even be finding some sort of kinship, you know, family relationship within those rock pools. Um, but, yeah, it was much more widely dispersed than... Than any of us. It's very clear you can't assume anything. Yes. Anymore. Absolutely. But Which is so a bummer because, in a way, we selected model species because we thought, oh, well, we'll <coughs> this will be, a, they'll be representative and we'll get some generalisation here. But it, you can uh, to a degree, you can. But localism okay. is suddenly um, becoming preeminent again when it's all been about, you know, when it runs away. So, the problem is, it means that there's more work to do because if you want to go and you manage a place you don't know, you, you might think, oh, let's use the corollary of this other example. Well, it could be completely different. You don't really know. <coughs> Generally, they're finding in the corals. They're finding that those sort of patterns are, are consistent now. So that's you know, if we're looking at habitat formings, using them as a the basis, they're the sort of the smaller scale dispersers as well. So if we if we look to um, protecting those processes, we should cover the, the more widely dispersed ones as well. Thank you, John. I'll just put Is it going to be a follow up on the uh, cryptic species of corals or something? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Zoe? Yeah, Zoe Richards from Wham. Um, yeah. Okay. There was a real bust for Jim because you know, like he got this awesome sample of a thousand individuals, and suddenly only a quarter of them could work on. 
Well, he could work on them all separately. You know. Just to give you an example of something else, something similar to that, but they, um, this, that we always thought, I would not say we to something like that, but uh, there was a, a, we always thought there was this one species of seaweed, one red seaweed, particularly in the rural like in the city. And some guys from Belgium went to the Philippines and they did some DNA sequencing and all this stuff. And decided so that within the Philippines there was something like 25, and they were all sort of isolated to different island groups, so it wasn't just sort of one offs, it was clusters of different things. And that they were in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean, it's probably about 90 species. But of course, they didn't name any of them, so from a the taxonomic point of view, we're still stuck with this. It's a species complex, we're just going to call it one thing, but it's a, yeah, it's a from molecular stuff. It's really exciting for taxonomists, but it also makes us quite good. Cool. I mean, yes. How are we going to deal with this? That's right. Yeah, and not a lot of funding available really to, to pursue those. It's not a it's not a small task to get to the bottom of that properly. Yeah, you weren't looking for it. Yeah. And perhaps the last question. Yeah, I was curious about the methods you used to identify the markers, and why if if you have any comments on why there was such variability in like somewhere like nine and somewhere like five thousand. Yeah, those markers. Um, so the seagrass was microsatellites, and we chose microsatellites because we had already done a lot of samples from other places, so we wanted to be able to to compare them. So yeah, so that's why there was a lot less markers with the microsatellites, whereas all the other taxa um, did the worked across their broader scale at the same time, so used the same SNPs approach. Kind of, you know, kind of regretted a bit that I didn't do that. But at the same time, I mean, I think what we've seen with seagrass is just because of their life history and, and the scale at which they are structured. Microsatellites actually did a pretty good job of resolving it. It's the things that fish that do have the broader dispersal, which which have been most difficult to get at those subtle patterns. So in a way, we have the markers appropriate. Yeah. So with snips, each, each marker is just two options. Where I mean, obviously with microsatellites, you get more alleles, and so we had nine markers, but with Halophila, I can't remember, it ranged from like four to eight alleles per, per marker, so we um, we needed to, we had the power to resolve individual um, clones, so they were still useful over that scale. Thanks very much. Well, we might leave it there if there are any more questions. We're going to have, we're actually meeting with the, um, these guys now to discuss more detail about um, the management implications and, and how we can bring that into the final report. Um, but we're going to have five or ten minutes just to get the room back into a uh, different shape. Um, but if you'd like to join me just to thank you guys for coming here today.